Welcome to these videos on teleportation. I've broken them into three parts. The first is what is teleportation, some historical data, and the beginnings of why you might want to do this. The second is two mechanisms that are essential for this to happen more consistently in your life. And the third is a more practical how you can begin to do this, a basic first step. So welcome to video one. Teleportation is the movement of your being from one place to another. Sometimes that involves taking your body with you so you actually physically relocate somewhere else. Sometimes just your consciousness goes somewhere else. Your body remains where it is, but it's like you can see yourself in another place. Sometimes in those situations, other people are aware that you're there and may even see you in some fashion there, yet your body remains where it originally started. You could also include in this the phenomena of walking through objects, people, walls. So clearly there's some kind of perhaps phase shift going on there where you move from temporarily and momentarily from one dimension to another, both consciously and physically. Sometimes these experiences happen and you're aware of them. Sometimes you're not aware of them and it's only after that you calculate, work out, reason that it must have happened. This is teleportation. Many Christians and mystics have reported this phenomenon over the centuries. These are spectacular stories and there often is an air of spectacularness to them. And yet, you see when you look at the Hebraic scriptures, although far from everyone was constantly experiencing these things, it appears much more normative, much more, yes, that sort of thing happens to those who want to seek God and move in those realms. One clear story in the scriptures, the book of Acts, is Philip, when he is transported. He is in one place, he's in Israel, and he's moved to somewhere, probably in Egypt, and he's taken to a road as he's waiting. A chariot comes by with an Ethiopian in who's high up in administrative authority in the land he comes from, and the man asks him about a passage in Isaiah, not understanding it. Philip is able to explain it to him, he, the Ethiopian has an encounter with God and makes a decision to believe that the man Jesus was the Christ to come. In that story, it's not so much that Philip is transported and then he's transported somewhere else after this story. He doesn't have to walk back all the way to Israel. The focus of the story is the Ethiopian and his hunger for God, and the fact that Philip is brought by the Spirit near him in an unusual way to explain to him what he's reading. That's the focus. It's the focus of the love that wants to tell people truth. And by the way, he's transported, he's teleported. It's also seem to be a common occurrence in the life of Elijah from the Old Testament. There's a moment where he is teleported right in front of an official who is looking for him, who the king has sent to find him, and he suddenly appears on the road in front of this official. The official is startled and interacts with Elijah telling him the message and receiving an answer from Elijah. And then Elijah promises to stay and meet the king. And in the story, the official is even frightened that even after this interaction, Elijah will disappear 
and so he will not be able to make the appointment with the king, and this official will be in trouble. So it's a known thing, a common knowledge, that Elijah would move this way, would be teleported this way. In fact, the scripture's report is by his follower, Elisha, who sees him caught up in a whirlwind and he's taken bodily into the whirlwind and, and vanishes, goes into another realm. This follower, Elisha, then goes back towards civilization and he meets the band of followers who would be hanging around normally with Elijah and he says to them, Elijah's gone. And the followers say, well, no, maybe we should search the mountains in the area or other places because maybe God has taken him to these mountains. Maybe God has taken him to that place. In other words, it was a known experience that he would do teleportation. And then we take the life of Jesus. At one point, the crowds were so infuriated about what he'd said that they took him up to the top of a hill and they were trying to throw him off the hill to his death, to the ground. And it's, the, it's reported that he simply walked through them. So some kind of teleportation phase shift. He just walked through them. Or perhaps he vanished at this point and appeared the other side of them. There's not enough detail in the text to be sure of which happened. He also relates a story that is then written into the Gospels of, an, of another spiritual being called the opposer, the adversary, who tries to derail what Christ is doing. And one of the ways he attempts to derail him is he takes him to the top of the Jewish temple and says to him, throw yourself off this temple because the angels will rescue you. You can do that. And the whole thing is a trick because if he does that, then he's not really relying on God to prove himself. He's relying on his own effort to go, look, I'm miraculous. Everyone can see. I can levitate to the ground. And he says, that's not what I'm going to do right now. I'm not just going to obey you, you opposer, you adversary. And he says, no. But he's allowed himself to be physically teleported to the top of this temple. So it's something that can be done to you. There are other times when they're trying to find Jesus to take him, to capture him. The authorities are trying to take him, even when he's talking in the temple courts. And it says that he hides in the temple, which kind of implies that somehow he becomes invisible to them, that he leaves, that he, he goes to another place, because they would know every corner of this temple and they couldn't find him. So teleportation is a known experience. It's something that happens. It's something that can happen to us. And it seems to be something that in, way, in some ways we are involved in at least allowing to happen to us. So why would you do it? This is not something to be sought and demonstrated just to be spectacular just to be look look how spiritual i am that i can do this that would reduce this to a mere magic trick these things may happen as one-offs but if we're going to walk in this reality then we have to have the motives to the line with god and that would be love love would motivate us to want this phenomenon to happen so that we could be in a position to better help other people. In the writings of Paul, a teacher of the early church, we get a glimpse of a moment when he says that this church should gather to pray and make a decision. And he says within it, wait 
until you know my spirit is with you. There's no further explanation. This is obviously normal. It's not something that he has to explain lengthily. They will know what he means. But somehow they will know that his spirit has arrived and, if you like, is part of the meeting. You hear a similar phrase from Elijah when he's talking about his servant who goes off to do something that he shouldn't do. And Elisha says, Did not my spirit go with you? And he saw what the servant did. Now, it's a desire to help people grow and mature that love motive that facilitates this process in a healthy way. If you've enjoyed this video, then you'll find the link to video two here and down below.